Welcome to the IoT Unicorn Podcast. This is Pete Bernard from Microsoft. And this podcast is for anyone interested in the long-term technology trends in the IoT space and the journey from here to there. So let's get started. Okay, so today's show is actually recently recorded, uh, just about a week or two ago, with Dr. David Rue, and he's the Chief Medical Officer of Microsoft. Been with the company about a year, uh, is based in the Bay Area, and uh, I actually met up with David, was introduced to him fairly recently on a project. Um, can't really talk about it, but uh, really interesting, really interesting person, and a really interesting background and story about how he got to Microsoft, and we spend a lot of time today talking about um, kind of the intersection of technology and healthcare, uh, what's going on there, not only from just an IoT side, but just an overall technology uh, perspective. You know, it's sort of like the the intersection of technology and certain things have incredible outcomes. You know, technology plus conspiracy theories is really bad, uh, but the intersection of technology and healthcare is really good. And um, some really fascinating things going on there that uh, hopefully will really revolutionize uh, what, what we're, where we're at. And I think another big takeaway for me in this conversation as I listened back over to it was really how important collaboration is. Um, collaboration in our own ecosystem, professional ecosystem, but also our personal collaboration, our collaboration amongst um, all these other humans on Earth to, uh, to figure this stuff out. So uh, without further ado, here's Dr. David Rue. Okay, well, we're here with Dr. David Rue from Microsoft. Uh, David, I really appreciate your time. We are um, we have a lot of things to talk about today. We're going to try to squeeze it into the allotted time period, but um, thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Pete. It's a real pleasure to be here. Good, good. Yeah, and uh, full transparency, uh, you know, something happened in the first conversation I had with David where it didn't record properly, so we're actually going through this one again. So, it should be nice and nice and well practiced. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, live and die by teams, I guess. But, um, anyway, David, so we, we, had, uh, as I mentioned, chatted a couple of times now and you're actually fairly new to Microsoft. I think before we get into a lot of really interesting topics, I think listeners want to hear about around, uh, digital transformation of healthcare and what's going on with COVID-19 and Microsoft. Maybe you can give us kind of a little, run up to how did you end up here at Microsoft? And you've been here, I think, almost exactly a year now. So maybe you can give us a little right. bit of background on yourself and kind of your journey to Microsoft. Sure. Well, uh, first of all, I'm a physician. I'm a healthcare researcher uh, and also a technologist. And really the combination of those three have evolved rather organically throughout my career. Uh, and it's been remarkable how those three have converged to, to allow us to be able to start thinking about how healthcare can be used to improve health outcomes. Or I should say how technology can be used to improve health outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, and really excited to be a part of that, pro uh, that, that program here at Microsoft uh, as we start uh, launching technologies, uh, predominantly cloud-based solutions with artificial intelligence to drive that. Uh, I, my story, I guess, begins when I was in college. I was uh, thinking quite a bit about you know, different types of th ways that I could uh, help people. And and I, I guess my initial thought was helping people would probably best serve as if I went to medical school. So did a curriculum, a pre-medical curriculum. And, uh, you know, as part of that program, I, you know, I, I think I, I gained a lot of the basic skills needed to be a doctor. But one of the things that I did also was I was curious about other types of activities and other types of skills. Uh, technology was always a fascination. This was around in the 1980s and video games were pretty popular then. Uh, these are the arcade video games, not the ones mm. that we typically use. Yeah, the good ones. Uh, the, the, the classics, <laughs> the Space Invaders, the Pac-Man, right. Mario. Uh, and I was fascinated by that. I just felt uh, what an incredible uh, way for us to be able to start thinking about how we can uh, uh, not only spend our time, but uh, but also um, how we could use technology to create new experiences. And I started uh, doing a lot of programming. In fact, I became a computer science major as well as a cellular molecular biologist. Hmm. Uh, and then I went to med school 
And in med school, there's not a whole lot of opportunity to use computers apart from a word processor. So I felt uh, in many ways that uh, that that part of my career journey was put on hold. Uh, and it was on hold for a while because what I ended up doing is after I graduated from medical school, I um, went down a path of exploration in healthcare, specifically looking at uh, ways that we could reduce variation and improve access to care and improve the overall quality of care. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was done predominantly uh, through what we refer to as guidelines. Uh, it turns out that if you were to go to a doctor uh, in, you know, probably your local doctor and you were to go to uh, maybe survey uh, the same type of, um, you know, ask another doctor across uh, the, the, the country or even the globe how they would treat the same type of condition, you'll get a lot of different responses. And in fact, when they've hmm. done analyses, they found that variation in care uh, is pretty dramatic, uh, even for things that have been pr proven to be, you know, beneficial. Hmm. Um, and and what we learned uh, in sort of some of the investigations that I was a part of and others have been actively looking at is that uh, a lot of that has to do with just uh, the fact that we don't have mechanisms to remind clinicians to provide that right information at the right time. And I started building basically programs that would provide that right information at the right time. Mm. It was very manual. Uh, in many right, cases, right. we had nurses and other clinicians run around the hospital, identifying patients, giving pieces of paper to doctors saying, oh, by the way, your your patient fulfills low risk criteria. You could switch them from an IV antibiotic to an oral antibiotic and send them home uh, right. when traditionally they might have stayed for another few days or even longer. And we ran these programs, we found that it was highly effective. And not only did it reduce the length of stay and reduce total cost, but when we followed up with these patients, they actually did quite well and they were mm -hmm. quite satisfied. So, you know, the less time you can spend at a hospital is always good. Yeah, for uh, sure. People were having a good time, <laughs> uh, you know, just, you know, finding that, hey, you know what, this is something that uh, provided value to just uh, the, the patient, uh, the health system. And, and that, really got me thinking about how do I start scaling this? Because, you know, you can't have a person run around the hospital with every piece of information. It, it really has to be automated. Mm -hmm. So working with some, uh, some colleagues, we put together some software that ultimately became uh, a company. Uh, and this company got acquired by Cerner, which is a large healthcare information technology company. And next thing I know, I'm I'm in the middle of uh, implementing EHRs all across the, the country and even the globe. And so, uh, mm -hmm. you know, seeing patients half the time and see, and, and kind of working with technology was, um, it was sort of my life for, for quite, quite a bit of my early part of my career. And right. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how technology is um, an enabler. It, it really helps us to be able to achieve some of the goals. Um, but it was really predominantly focused on the inpatient and in clinic experience. And mm -hmm. so I started thinking about, you know, what about outside of the hospital? Uh, could, could we actually start, you know, engaging patients and family members in a more effective manner than simply uh, just sending them a, a text reminder and what we or act giving them access to the patient portal. And so what we, um, uh, started thinking about it as, you know, it is an industry uh, was this whole category called digital health and connected care. Uh, and there were many consumer companies that were looking to get into the space. You know, Apple would be a good one, but also Samsung. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had an opportunity to talk to folks at Samsung, uh, shared a bit about what I was interested in terms of where I wanted to take technology and they had shared a similar vision. So it was, it was kind of a great match. And they asked me to be their chief medical officer. Uh, for six years, I was chief medical officer at Samsung. And uh, during those time periods of working at Cerner and the electronic health world uh, and also working at Samsung, I, I kind of got a ex chance to experience both ends of the spectrum in terms of what clinicians experience and what patients do. And that bridge uh, was something that I was looking to find a way to make it more seamless, more ubiquitous, uh, which really brought me to Microsoft because of the fact that with its enterprise cloud infrastructure, ability for us to be able to uh, have those communications data uh, communicating also now uh, more freely within the electronic health record space into using HL7 fire standards uh, into a common platform. We could do a lot more than what we are currently doing. And right. uh, that right. really is the opportunity for all of us to start thinking about how technology can help us achieve some of those <clears throat> outcomes. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating. I think it's, I mean, you can imagine healthcare is kind of one of the great 
kind of data science challenges we have, right? I mean, there's such massive amount of information and knowledge base. And like you were saying, the knowledge and the the uh, the way people are treated and the treatment plans kind of vary. And, and, you know, having access to all of the knowledge collectively and having all the data analyzed. I mean, you know, I'm a big, I'm a big Fitbit Versa fan myself. And, uh, you know, the measure itself is, is a pretty key part of my kind of regimen. And, um, you know, especially people that are not doing too well, being able to have all of that data accessible from from edge devices and and being able to kind of you know basically get to the right outcomes and and treatment plans is pretty pretty critical stuff i mean you can't think of too many more purpose driven uh you know business outcomes than that um so that's that's amazing i mean it must be you know and you're you you know i know when i joined microsoft like the first two years people said like it takes two years to find the bathroom at microsoft because it's <laughs> there's so much going on so you're in, you're a year into it and of course um you know of course we you know, and we'll talk about sort of the obvious elephant in the room here i mean you've been in the middle of helping us steer through this pandemic um you could probably you know halfway through your first year. So that, that must've been quite a challenge to sort of come on board and then sort of this all happened, right? I mean, what, 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 can you give us a little insight as to what was that like? How did that sort of ramp up for you? Yeah. When I joined Microsoft, uh, I guess so there's sort of two chapters or two parts to my uh, mm-hmm. time at Microsoft. The first six months were essentially uh, spent working very closely with our partners, our clients, implementing the technologies, the cloud-based technologies to help them achieve some of their business goals. And then when COVID hit, uh, and it really started in uh, for us in January, I know in December was probably one of the first time we started hearing about right. this uh, in China, but we have uh, colleagues, we have uh, Microsoft folks that work in China, and we were uh, very concerned about their health and, and what was going on. And then when it continued to spread throughout the country and then to other parts of Southeast Asia, uh, we realized that this was something that was um, going to require a, a, a pretty uh, co- a coordinated effort within Microsoft around this. It turns out that my background as a physician is in infectious disease. Mm. I was actually an AIDS physician uh, <laughs> during the time uh, during the AIDS epidemic. And mm. I was you know, seeing patients uh, that that were, you know, fairly young, healthy individuals that were that would deteriorate in a in a rather short time period, um, and, and succumb to the illness. Uh, today, uh, this there's so many parallels. You know, you're seeing this affect so many uh, young and as well as older and individuals. We're, we're, we're seeing um, a need for public health and and also a need for us to be able to accelerate the time to research uh, to, to to vaccine and treatments. Uh, mm-hmm. We have ne- we never developed a vaccine for AIDS, but we did come up with a treatment that, mm-hmm. in many ways, has allowed us to be able to better control that. And right. and you know so with with that as sort of a backdrop, I was asked to serve as the international coordinator for Microsoft's COVID-19 uh, response. And uh, that was uh, an incredible opportunity to understand, you know, really all the different groups within Microsoft that touched the different countries that uh, interface with the governments and the non-government agencies and what we as a large technology company can do to lean in. Uh, that involves uh, providing software, cloud services, uh, AI uh, skills, resources. Um, and, and in many ways, that was our first response to how we could address the pandemic. Mm-hmm. When the pandemic hit, uh, or I should say when the infections uh, started appearing in uh, the states, particularly in the Kirkland area near, near Seattle, that really hit home for uh, many of us uh, at the Microsoft family because, you know, that's where <laughs> our offices yeah, are, I'm, our main I'm headquarters are. So, yeah. Yeah. So you, you, know, you remember very <laughs> well. And and that during that time, uh, we we were recognizing that we needed to do more than just simply provide our, our technologies. We needed to innovate. We needed to solve some of these problems. Mm-hmm. So in working with uh, organizations like Providence Health System, we customized our chatbots and made them COVID-19 specific screening and triage tools. We tied it directly to um portals that could allow for uh, virtual care assessments and then um, tied it into lab testing. We um, built out 
mechanisms to provide food services and other types of critical supplies to people that were quarantined at home. Uh, we started investigating how we could work through collaboratives uh, to better en enable exchange of data and promote uh, the, the development of a, a variety of different types of solutions I should say um, ways for us to be able to procure uh, critical supplies such as uh, personal protective equipment. And yeah. uh, and and so that process was um, an extraordinary time. We partnered with companies like GE Healthcare to create virtual ICUs to enable uh, multiple patients to be managed by a single uh, trained clinician and um, started spending a lot of time thinking about treatment, you know, with thinking yeah. about how AI and, and a variety of other tools can be used uh, to help accelerate the pace of uh, discovery. Um, uh, both from a scientific R and D perspective, as well as uh, clinical trial recruitment. Yeah. Um, and so this has been an incredible journey for us. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, I was looking at the recent inspire conference and some of the, the talks there going on and, you know, I mean, Sati is saying that we've, we've sort of advanced, um, you know, in two months, we sort of advanced about two years worth of, uh, innovation, uh, you know, in, in the time of kind of great crises, uh, you know, throughout history, it's sort of, uh, potential real accelerant for a lot of historic inevitables, right? So, you know, we were on this certain trajectory. I mean, you know, separate topic, but, you know, online learning and other things, that was sort of a, a thing that was nascent and being experimented with. And then all of a sudden it was sort of like, we're all going to do it now, you know, at the same time. Yep. Same with a lot of the obviously remote collaboration that we're doing. So I can imagine in the healthcare space, I mean, you had been working for a long time on you know, uh, kind of a the, the whole digital transformation of healthcare, and now because of of the pandemic, we've had to really accelerate a lot of that stuff, and really you know bring to bear a lot of the technologies we were kind of trying out and really sort of making them much more mainstream a lot more quickly. Um, yeah. And I know before the before this particular chat, I was mentioning to you about you know we're we're we've been involved recently, and in, and how do we take some of the techniques we've done for retail in terms of supply chain management? in your in a typical store and how do we apply that to you know healthcare facilities so they can understand you know uh, their supply of ppe and other things and how can we automate that um, you know using a lot of the the edge edge ai as well as cloud capabilities that we would have in a, in a typical grocery store and so mm -hmm. we're seeing all this stuff just sort of happen and and obviously because of the pandemic there's obviously an underlying you know urgency right that we need to cooperate and innovate, you know, as fast as possible. So, so that must be, I mean, I can imagine, I always ask people when they say like, you come in the morning, you have a cup of coffee and then what happens? I can imagine in your job, you have, you, you have a cup of coffee and then like kind of, there's like probably about 2000 emails in your inbox. <laughs> a lot of times these emails are things that uh, have a direct relevance to what we're seeing uh, and living today. So for instance, much of what uh, I've been focusing on recently have been things such as return to work uh, and, and yeah. return to school. You know, yeah. These are topics that uh, we know are of high importance to many individuals. Technology can play an important role, but in the setting of a pandemic, almost everything has to be done with health and public safety and, uh, uh, you know, and, and mechanisms that will allow us to be able to suppress and, and or, and or make sure that the infection doesn't get out of control. So yeah. there's just, um, an interesting, uh, I, I guess, a uh, collision course between how healthcare, uh, has now touched every single vertical, whether it's retail, like you're describing, yeah. whether it's manufacturing, yeah, and, hospitality. Uh, and now education, hospitality, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's been, uh, I, I think, a, a, a learning experience for all of us because we're now starting to realize uh, that you know this that this pandemic isn't going to go away, um, you know, sim simply by um, uh, providing some of the existing technology. Yeah. We're going to have to to sort of um, outthink it, uh, build the the strategies to to get um, a faster delivery of the of the or, or, or um, maturation of our R and D. Um, so we learn what works. Um, a great example would be convalescent plasma. We, you know, we knew that this worked uh, for other types of conditions, but to enable this to be something that we could use more widely, there are two factors. Uh, and it all boiled down to one, really. Uh, we need more convalescent plasma. We mm. need more donors, mm. more donors for the studies and more donors for the actual, uh, you know, uh, I guess the convalescent plasma that could potentially be delivered and transfused into patients. And that um, has kind of gotten us refocused on what can technology do to help clinical trial recruitment or donor mm -hmm. recruitment. Mm -hmm. That's, um, 
you know, it's funny because I, I don't think that in the past, if I would have thought, you know, what is it that will accelerate the the research and the ability that I would have landed on that being uh, sort of one of the critical pieces, but it is. And, and that's one of the things that we're starting to recognize that sometimes we're surprised in, in um, what is actually the critical piece. Yeah. And, and um, one of the other interesting byproducts, I think of this, um, you know, I know when we sit down at dinner every night with my, my teenage kids, we, we talk about the news of the day and this is inevitably is a topic. And I, at least one of the things I think that's been, I guess, positive out of this is we're, we're, you know, not only, you know, innovating like, like crazy to, to, to outthink this, as you said, but we're also becoming a lot more, uh, educated around data science. And people are now able to talk about numbers and analyze data and talk about our values and, you know, really be a lot more analytical and understanding data. And I think that's that's just good. I mean, that's just good for everything moving forward. Um, and again, sort of accelerating that trend, right, where, you know, now everyone has to become pretty fluent in understanding statistics and data and be able to yeah. talk about it in a rational way, you know, regardless of whether you're a high school student or, or, you know, a technology professional. So I, I think it'll be fascinating to see, you know, down the road, how much of the accelerations kind of stick um, some of the new habits and practices and skills that we're building and things that we're doing together kind of stick as, as more permanence. Um, so yeah, yeah. It, it's fascinating. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, I saw Bill Gates on CNN last night. Um, it's always great to see Bill G as we like to call him around here, um, mm -hmm. talking about vaccines, hot topic. And, um, um, you know, I think it's, it's going to be, it's kind of, that's uh, going to become the kind of the next chapter of the story at some point as we get into that phase. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of factors there. Obviously, there's the development and the, the new techniques to develop vaccines that are being pioneered right now. Obviously, then the, the logistics of manufacture and distribution, right, which is going to be interesting. Um, and I think the last time we talked when we didn't record, but uh, it was fascinating because you were talking about kind of the, the paradox of supply and demand with vaccines, right? Like, yeah. how do we make sure we make enough? Uh, you know, make sure there's enough demand to take the vaccine, but also make sure we have enough supply to get it out. Well, one of the strange things that we've realized is that, and, and it ties into what your earlier statement around how we're becoming far more educated, but at the same time, we're also recognizing that, um, that not everyone uh, believes the facts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because of that, um, education and our ability for us to engage people uh, to un help them understand their concerns and to be able to then uh, create greater uh, awareness programs, adoption programs is so critical. So with regards to vaccines, it's very possible that we may have folks that need it that will refuse it. Right. And what we want to do is we want to get ahead of that. Uh, we know that there are certain groups that this would be of highest importance. You know, these are age groups, uh, demographics such as ethnicity, uh, comorbidities, uh, those are individuals for whom this should be in all likelihood be prioritized first, uh, mm -hmm. just given the fact that uh, they're the ones who actually probably will need it the most to prevent the biggest to, to have the biggest impact, which yeah. is death. Yeah. At the same time, they may be the ones least likely to respond to it. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. so, so we're kind of like in this, you know, it's always this, um, this uh, double edged sword, you know, we're kind of recognizing who needs it, but they may not uh, want it. Uh, they may not respond to it. We may need to actually do a second booster. Um, how do we actually do uh, proper and, and fair allocation of this? Uh, many of these things, uh, well, hopefully it'll be a problem that we can address soon because, you know, to have a vaccine would be so, is so important. Sure. Um, but, but, uh, you know, again, w w with every step along the way, we're realizing that there's some challenges. Yeah. Yeah. I, re I recall actually when I was very young, the, uh, we had the swine flu vaccines and we had to, I don't know how old I was, but I do remember going with my family in a big, big crowd. I don't know, it was big gymnasiums or something like that. And there was a huge long line. We all lined up for our swine flu vaccines in the arm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, obviously the double edged sword of um, the information distribution, which is fantastic. And everyone has the opportunity to be informed at the same time with social media and other things. People have the opportunity to be misinformed. And um, and so there, there's a lot of. Uh, challenges out there. I'd heard some statistics, something like 
the seasonal flu vaccine only has about an uptake of about in the 40 percent range, even yeah. though it's been pretty, it's pretty well established that that is a, a really good way to prevent the flu. And and, you know, we've all had the flu. It's pretty nasty. And and for some people, it can be deadly. So so I think that will be that'll be another thing is like, how do we use technology to help people, like you said, kind of understand you know, what's, what's going to be healthy for them and also help them feel comfortable, you know, taking that step forward to, to invest in their health, which ultimately is our, all of our health, right? I mean, it's kind of the, um, you know, the fact that we all need to, to protect each other from this virus and, um, yeah. you know, getting people educated on that. So that'll be yeah. sort of the next wave. And like you said, can't come soon enough, I guess. Um, yeah. As we see this thing unfolding. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's the one key lesson learned from this pandemic is that this is not anything that one individual or one organization can solve. It's right. going to require a coordinated community effort around this um, to both protect us as well as to get through it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely. But well, we always say IoT is a team sport, but uh, <laughs> in the case of uh, COVID-19, it kind of takes it to a whole other level. Right. But uh, right. Sure. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, David, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Like I said, this is the second time we've had this conversation. <laughs> so, but I really appreciate it. any any kind of final thoughts or things that uh, our our listeners should be aware of in terms of kind of you know what you're what you're working on here at Microsoft or what they should be doing to help themselves. Well, one of the things that I'm most proud about is that Microsoft is taking a very, um, I'd say. Uh, a, a very important position of their role and responsibility in the mm -hmm. community and mm -hmm. the world. Uh, we look at uh, us as responsible corporate citizens. We have to do what we can, lean in to help address the COVID-19 crisis, uh, innovate as quickly as possible through partnerships, uh, but also address other issues that we face today. Uh, this could be everything from racial injustice, um, you know, societal, um, you know, uh, issues, uh, such as, uh, also environmental issues. Mm -hmm. and, and what we have found is that, uh, these are all interconnected where, where healthcare used to be about just simply a medical condition and treating it. What we realized that the most significant factors in many cases have to do with what we'll refer to as social determinants of health your income, your education, where you live, um, you know, the foods that you eat and your ability to afford those foods, the people that you are, are socializing with or not socializing with, um, you know, these are all, it's, it's an interconnected world yeah. and healthcare is becoming uh, interconnected in so many different ways. Uh, so as we think holistically about how we improve one's health and well-being, it'll probably touch on things that we never even envisioned in the past. Mm. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. I mean, yeah, you're right. It is a holistic approach that we need to take and we are much more connected probably than we ever imagined. So good, good stuff. Well, David, again, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. And uh, I'll, I'll see you around. Thanks, Pete. Okay, thanks. This is Pete Bernard. You've been listening to the IoT Unicorn podcast. And thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for the next episode and feel free to give us some feedback at the IoT Unicorn at Microsoft.com. Thank you.